Hey everybody, welcome back to The Wolf Pit with another episode of What Are We Eating? Sausage Gravy and Biscuits, SOS, also known as Shit on a Shingle, or simply Hamburger Gravy, or Cream Chip Beef on Toast, also known as SOS, or Shit on a Shingle, and finally Red Eye Gravy, are all inexpensive, simple to make, and most of all, they're a delicious breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Well, a while back, I made a Turkey Spam Thanksgiving dinner. And when I was done cooking my can of turkey spam, I used the drippings to make spam turkey gravy. You can't have a Thanksgiving dinner without turkey gravy, can you? Well, in this case, it was spam turkey gravy. And I know what you're thinking. Spam turkey gravy? Gross. But it wasn't gross at all. It was delicious. So I said to myself, if turkey spam gravy is good, why not make country spam gravy and biscuits? Which is what I did this past Sunday morning. How did it turn out? Let's watch and see. So I started off with a standard 12 ounce can of Spam, which costs $2.79, which equates to 23 cents an ounce, or $3.72 a pound, which is about the same price for a pound of breakfast sausage. Contrary to what some people think that Spam is made of mystery meat, it actually only contains a few simple ingredients. Pork with ham, salt, water, potato starch, sugar, and sodium nitrate, which some people like to avoid. But I eat as much as I can. I gotta preserve these good looks somehow, so let's get started with the gravy. Just slide the Spam out of the can, and then dice it up into small chunks. I have my cast iron skillet over medium heat, and I toss in a chunk of butter for you, the people, simply because butter makes everything better. Give the butter a quick stir to coat the bottom of the skillet. And finally, the cubed up Spam. Saute the Spam around for a minute. Then continue this process until the Spam begins to render and it begins to get to your perfect crispification. Once the Spam has reached your desired crispification, add about a quarter cup of all-purpose flour. Then give it a mix and continue to mix until all the flour is combined and then continue to cook for two minutes to get the raw taste out of the flour. Now pour in about four cups of whole milk. Yes, it should be whole milk. It just won't be the same with low fat or skim milk. So if you're worried about fat and calories, you need to go eat a grapefruit. Now I put Mr. Pig to work and ground in some freshly ground black pepper. And I'm not sure why I haven't showed him before, but I use Mr. Pig all the time. Now give it all a mix and keep your heat on medium. Then I added my secret ingredient for sausage and chip beef gravy. A few drops of Worcestershire sauce. I guess it's no longer a secret. Now give it a good mix with the spatula. And then remove the spatula and put in the robo stir. I love this little thing for making gravies and roux. My wife got it for me for Christmas a couple years ago, and I use it all the time. I'll put a link in the description box if you want to check them out. Now let the robot start do its thing while the gravy starts to thicken. Then give it a taste for seasoning. And of course, I needed more black pepper. But what really surprised me is it needed some salt. I initially didn't add salt. I thought the salt in the Spam would be sufficient. After adding salt and pepper, the gravy had thickened up to the point the robo stir just stood in place. So I removed it and began the laborious task of stirring manually. 
Once the gravy was nice and thick, we turned off the heat, gave it one more taste before serving, and you guessed it, more black pepper was required. Now the gravy was ready to serve over grandma's soon to be world famous secret recipe biscuits that for some reason she packs into Grand's cans. Add as little or as much spam gravy as you like. And once again, I can never have too much black pepper and cream gravy. So this was my plate and I needed more. Everyone's not gonna wanna have this much black pepper. So I'll eat mine the way I like and you eat yours the way you like. I scooped up a spoonful of biscuits and Spam gravy. And besides the chunks of Spam, it looks just like sausage gravy. So into my trap it went to see how it turned out. And it was surprisingly good, not bad at all. It was nice and creamy, it was rich, it had just the right amount of pepper, and overall, it was really good. But it definitely didn't have as much flavor as sausage gravy or cream chip beef gravy. It was missing a little something. So I think the next time, I'll add just a pinch of sage, which I think would help mimic sausage gravy a bit more, but it would definitely give it a bit more flavor. Overall, I think the Spam gravy and biscuits was a success, and I'll definitely make it again. So the next time you look into your fridge or freezer and there's no sausage, or look at your pantry and there's no chip beef, see if you have a can of Spam laying around and give it a try. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Wolf Pit with another episode of What Are We Eating? You guys already know my love for Spam, but there's quite a few flavors I haven't tried yet, and Turkey Spam is one of them. To be honest, Turkey Spam scares me and doesn't even sound good. But it is my duty to try Turkey Spam for you, the people, so you don't have to. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different than I normally do. I'm going to cook Turkey Spam two ways. I'm going to slice and pan fry one can, and I'm going to bake a whole can like you would a turkey, and then slice it like you would a turkey. Once the turkey spam is cooked two ways, I'm going to make a turkey spam gravy and create a highly processed but very cheap and hopefully delicious turkey dinner with turkey spam and turkey spam gravy along with cheap instant mashed potatoes and cheap instant stuffing. So I'm not only doing this to try the turkey spam, but also to see if a decent tasting turkey dinner can be made for someone who loves spam and or doesn't want to fool around and cook a whole turkey or make sides from scratch for a special dinner. This is meant to be a fun meal, and I'm in no way suggesting this is a good healthy meal that you should make. That is, unless it's delicious and you want to make it. I'm going to fry one can per the instructions, but then I'm going to bake the second can and change up the cooking time and temperature because I'm going to cook it whole and then slice it. So here's the first can of oven roasted turkey spam. I put it on my toaster oven baking sheet, then it went into a preheated 325 degree toaster oven for 25 to 30 minutes or until golden brown and heated through. Now this could be the makings of a spam disaster, but we're gonna find out either way. I'm gonna slice the second can of turkey spam with my Musubi slicer that a viewer sent me, but it came directly from Amazon and there wasn't a name on it, so I don't know who sent it. But whoever sent it to me, thank you very much. So you simply put the whole can of spam into the slicer and then push down for nice uniform pieces. The slicer worked great, except it was bigger than the can of Spam, which left a sliver of Spam on the end, which I tried straight out of the can. It certainly didn't look very appetizing, did it? But I've got to tell you, I was very happily surprised. It was very good straight out of the can. Now the slices go into a preheated skillet over medium-high heat. Let them cook for four to five minutes per side, or until the slices are to your desired crispification. Normally I fry Spam in a dry skillet, and it renders enough fat to cook in its own fat. But Hormel wasn't kidding. This is really lean, and I had to add some olive oil after a few minutes. After four minutes, I gave the Spam a flip, even though it wasn't as golden brown as I wanted yet. So I'll end up having to flip it one more time. After four minutes, I gave it a final flip for another minute for a total of nine minutes. After baking for 25 minutes in a 325 degree toaster oven, our turkey spam was done. And at this point, it wasn't looking very good. It looked like it imploded in the middle and the outer portion turned into a scab. I was gonna slice it with a knife. 
but since I had my new Musubi Slicer out, I figured I'd use it. Well, that wasn't really a great idea. The Slicer cut the Spam straight out of the can easily and perfectly. However, the baked Spam formed a skin of armor, and as I tried to slice it, it wouldn't cut through the skin without mushing up the inside beam. And if you notice the painted fingernails, I assure you, they're not mine. I pressed on and finally finagled it through the Spam without turning it into roadkill. But the slicer was made to cut Spam straight out of the can, so it's really no big deal. Once it was sliced, it ended up looking just like real roasted turkey skin. I tried the go-to, pan fried Spam first. It was perfectly crispified, looked good, and smelled good. After taking a bite, I was sold on this turkey Spam. It was crispy on the outside, moist in the middle, and simply delicious. Like most people, I love crispy turkey skin, so I was really anxious to try the end piece of the roasted turkey Spam first. Now doesn't that look like real turkey skin? Now it wasn't super crispy, but it was close enough to be amazing for meat out of a can. The meat on the inside may not have looked very good once cooked, but in this case, looks are deceiving. It was delicious. I had to grab a piece of the faux turkey skin. And again, doesn't that look just like real turkey skin? It not only looked like real turkey skin, it tasted like real turkey skin. At this point, I was really surprised, and I could have just ended the video right now and ate both cans of Spam. But I still gotta make turkey Spam gravy, stuffing, and mashed potatoes. For the turkey Spam gravy, I'm gonna use the same skillet I fried the Spam in, along with the little bits and pieces. With the Spam being super lean, I need to add some fat to make a roux. I'm using butter, but you can use oil if you like. Give that a mix around, then add flour. Then continue mixing until all the butter and flour are incorporated and smooth. Once the roux cooked for a couple minutes, stir in a little bit of chicken broth. Then as it thickens, add a little bit more at a time. Once all the broth is added, season with salt, pepper, and rubbed sage. Bring it up to a light boil, then let it simmer until it's to your desired consistency. And then it's done. I figured everyone already knows how to make instant mashed potatoes and instant stuffing, so I really didn't need to show you how to do that. I'm going to add the turkey Spam gravy to the mashed potatoes, and just when you think you have enough gravy, add more. Then add gravy to the stuffing, and the same rule applies. When you think you have enough, add more. And of course the gravy also goes on to the Spam slices and into my drink glass too. Can you ever have enough gravy? At this point, my pie hole turned into a waterfall. I couldn't wait to dig in. Doesn't that look good? Especially if you don't know what the meat is. I tried the baked turkey ham first, and the skin didn't want to give up the meat, so I had to persuade it. I know it's hard to believe, but oven roasted turkey spam is fan freaking tastic I mean, it really is delicious on its own, but it's phenomenal with the gravy. The faux skin adds such a great flavor and texture. And of course, I had to have one more bite, along with more gravy. The pan-fried turkey Spam was next. Had I not just had the baked turkey Spam with faux skin, I would be really happy with the taste and texture of the pan-fried Spam. Even though the pan-fried Spam was really delicious, I'm missing that skin of the baked Spam. But as you can see, it was still good enough for another bite, with more gravy of course, before moving on to the mashed potatoes and stuffing. A Couple years ago, I'd like to say I created candied Spam. I'm really not sure if I really created candied Spam, but I've never seen it done before, so until I see that someone did it before me, I'm going to consider myself the creator of candied Spam, also known as Crack Spam appropriately named by you, the people, because once you make it, and once you try it, you just can't stop eating it. 
So if somebody did make Candy Spam before me, please keep it on the down low and let me still believe I created Candy Spam so I can continue to be a legend in my own mind. Don't burst my bubble. So on September 23rd, 2019, Spam released their limited edition Pumpkin Spice Spam. And I'll admit, right off the bat, I said to myself, Self, it's a joke. It's a scam. Nothing good can come out of this. Avoid your temptations and stay away from Pumpkin Spice Spam. Well, I may be a legend in my own mind, but I have the willpower of a gnat and I immediately ordered two cans. But don't judge me. I bought this for you, the people, so you didn't have to. Well, I have this problem. I'm an instinctive buyer. I'll buy things that I don't need or have no use for and then try to figure out something to do with them or just get rid of it. So just like with the can of macadamia nuts, I had no idea what to do with these two cans of pumpkin spice spam. On the cans of pumpkin spice spam, it shows cubed up spam on top of waffles with whipped cream. It doesn't sound too bad, but it's very boring. I felt I owed it to you, the people, to do something a little bit more creative with the pumpkin spice spam. I did the obvious and made a pumpkin spice spam pumpkin pie cheesecake. And here's how we did it. Obviously, you have to open up the can of pumpkin spice spam first. When you open up the can, you immediately get the strong pumpkin spice aroma. It's not an overwhelming aroma, but rather the aroma your house would have if you were baking a pumpkin pie. As you can see, the color of the spam is much different than original spam, obviously due to the seasonings. So Mrs. Wolf Pit put her knife skills to use and cut off a thin slice for us to try right out of the can. Spam on its own will make my mouth water, but the Spam combined with the pumpkin spice, I was drooling like a rabid dog. So into my pie hole it went. And I've got to say, I was very pleasantly shocked at the flavor of the pumpkin spice Spam. I was expecting a very subtle pumpkin spice flavor, but that wasn't the case at all. But it had a very good prominent pumpkin spice flavor that complemented the Spam, but still let you enjoy the flavor of the Spam. Then it was time to make the pumpkin spice Spam crack. And all you need to do is cube up your Spam, place the cube Spam into a skillet over medium-high heat, along with the other half of the piece we tried out of the can cold, because of course we have to try a piece fried, and then mix it occasionally, let the Spam brown and render for about five minutes. After a few minutes, our slice of pumpkin spice Spam was nice and browned and ready for me to try. Now it certainly smelled and looked delicious. Let's just hope it tastes delicious. So into the old pie hole it went. And it certainly didn't let me down, but just like with regular Spam, I prefer it straight out of the can. So once all our pumpkin spice Spam was browned up, it was time to turn it into crack. And all you need to do is add some brown sugar. Then once your brown sugar's been added, constantly stir it. Don't walk away or the sugar will burn and it'll turn all bitter and you have to throw it away. Once the brown sugar and the Spam have cooked for about three minutes, remove it from the heat and onto a plate and make sure you have it separated. Otherwise, you're gonna have a big hard rock of candied Spam. While our Spam is cooling and getting hard, Let's make the batter for our cheesecake. In a large bowl, combine two blocks of cream cheese, which is a total of 16 ounces, and three quarters cup of firmly packed brown sugar. And then give it a good mix with a hand mixer. Once the cream cheese and brown sugar are thoroughly mixed, add 15 ounces of pumpkin pie filling, and then give it another good mix with the hand mixer. And like you guys have heard me say before, I'm no baker, and I don't understand why we can't just throw everything in the bowl and mix it up. Thankfully, Mrs. Wolf Pit was here to take control of the baking part. Next, add one tablespoon of all-purpose flour, and then we're gonna add three eggs, but the recipe says to add one at a time and mix between each egg. That's the type of thing that really confuses me as a non-baker. What difference would it make if you added three eggs at once versus one at a time?
Now add the second egg and two teaspoons of vanilla extract. And then give it another good mix. And finally add the third and final egg. And a teaspoon and a half of pumpkin pie spice extract. Now give it one final mix. Now let's give our candied spam a good mix and just listen to how crunchy it is. I tried a piece of the pumpkin spice candied spam first before we mixed it in with the cheesecake mix. And I've got to say, it's every bit as good, if not better, than the original crack spam. So before I ate the whole plate of pumpkin spice candy spam, we had to put it into the batter. Then give it a good mix to get all the candy spam combined. Once everything was combined, we ladled the mixture into two store-bought graham cracker pie crust. If you want to make your own pie crust, that's even better. Once the pie shells are filled, the pies go into a 350 degree oven for 50 minutes. And then after they bake for 50 minutes at 350 degrees, they rest for two hours and then they go into the refrigerator. Now here's our finished pumpkin spice spam pumpkin cheesecakes and I think they both turned out looking pretty good. The first one, the crust seemed to stay together better, but the second one looked like it got a little bit crumbly. I think we might have accidentally bought two different brands of pie shells, or two different types of pie shells. Either way, it didn't end up affecting the taste at all. So Mrs. Wolfpick got her knife skills going again, and very carefully cut us a beautiful slice of pumpkin spice spam pumpkin cheesecake. And I couldn't have asked her to do a nicer job. The slice turned out absolutely perfect. As you can see, there's going to be spam in every bite. So there you have it. Our two finished slices of pumpkin spice spam pumpkin cheesecake pie. That's a mouthful. And you know I wasn't going to try this without whipped cream. You gotta have whipped cream with pumpkin pie, especially with Spam pumpkin pie. And just by looking at that, if you didn't know there was Spam in there, you wouldn't know until you took a bite of it. So we went in for the first bite. And it certainly looked good to me. What say you, the people? So into the old pie hole it went. Ha, uh, get it, pie hole, in the literal sense this time. The texture of the pumpkin pie cheesecake was super creamy. Not as cheesecakey as I thought it would be. I don't know if that's just because of the recipe or what. It seemed a little light for a cheesecake, which to me is a good thing. I love the creaminess of the pumpkin pie cheesecake and then the contrast of textures when you bit into the crunchy candied spam. But then when you got through the crunchy on the outside of the candied spam, you get the moist, meaty texture of the Spam, which gives your taste buds one last punch of pumpkin spice. I already knew, but was still disappointed that Mrs. Wolf Pit wasn't going to try it. She doesn't like pumpkin pie or pumpkin spice, but she does love Spam. My daughter had just gotten home when we took these out of the refrigerator, and I gave her a piece to try, and she loved it. But then she asked what the crunchy stuff was inside. As soon as I told her what it was, she didn't take another bite, which frustrated me because she liked it before she knew what was in it, and then once she knew what was in it, she didn't like it anymore. So that led me to take drastic measures. I cut up a few slices and took them over to a few neighbors. I let them know that it was pumpkin spice spam, pumpkin cheesecake pie. After they gave me funny looks, I asked them to please text me what they thought of it. Some of the people didn't like spam to begin with, some didn't like pumpkin pie to begin with, some didn't like either, or some liked one or the other, but they all said they'd give it a try. So it was a mixed group, and I got very mixed opinions. Not everyone was crazy about it, 
But the one that made me the happiest was the person that tried it that doesn't even like Spam, loved it. They said if all Spam tasted like that, they'd eat it every day. So as with all foods, everyone's not going to like the same thing. And some people mentally make themselves not like something before they even try it. And I gotta admit, pumpkin spice Spam does sound a little weird. But I'm really glad I tried it because I really loved it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Wolf Pit. Today I'm making Spam Musubi. I've heard of this Hawaiian treat for a long, long time and never thought much about it. Musubi is found everywhere in Hawaii and can be made many different ways with lots of ingredients and combination of ingredients. They're obviously very popular in 7-Elevens and other convenience stores in Hawaii, as you can tell from the pictures I found while researching Musubi. So I finally got the gumption and bought the few items needed to make it. So let's get started. Let's start by making the rice, and you want to use sushi rice or short grain rice. Rinse the rice really well until the water runs clear, then cook the rice according to the directions on the bag. Like I said in the beginning, everybody makes musubi and there's many different ways to make it. Most of the recipes I've seen use just plain, unseasoned sushi rice. And I've seen some recipes that use a dry Japanese season called fewer cake. I know, I know, you guys let me know that I butchered the name. It's not furry cake, it's furikake. So I'm gonna make the rice just like you would if you were making sushi and add a little bit of sweet and a little bit of sour. In a large bowl, add white sugar and rice wine vinegar. Give it a good mix until all the sugar is dissolved. Now add the cooked rice. Now give it all a good mix until all the liquid is absorbed. Now cover with plastic wrap and place in the refrigerator until you're ready to use it. Here I have a 12 ounce can of low sodium Spam that I'm gonna cut into eight equal pieces. There's tons of different varieties of Spam. You can use any you like. Now let's fry the Spam in a skillet over medium heat. There's no need to add any oil. There's plenty of fat in the Spam. And you wanna make sure you keep your heat moderate you don't want to brown the Spam too quickly or it'll burn. Now let it fry for two minutes. And then after two minutes, give it a flip. Now let it fry for two more minutes. And then repeat this process one more time for a total cooking time of four minutes per side or until the Spam is nice and golden brown. Now remove the Spam from the pan. Well, look at that. I'm a poet and didn't know it. And then wipe off any excess grease. Then add sugar, soy sauce, and mirin. Give it a good mix and bring it to a boil. And then reduce the heat to medium and let it simmer for about five minutes. And then add the fried Spam. Now let the Spam simmer in the sauce for about five minutes or until it begins to reduce. Now here's what it should look like after about five minutes. Now I'm going to repurpose the Spam can and use it as a mold. I've lined the inside with plastic wrap. Now fill it about halfway with rice and then by the time you pack it down, it should be about a third full. If you plan on making a lot of musubi in the future or you wanna be Mr. and Mrs. Fancy Pants, you can actually buy a musubi mold. Now add a piece of the Spam and press it down a little bit more. And then wrap it up and pull it out. Here I have four sheets of nori, which is dry seaweed. You can cut them as thick or as thin as you like. I'm just gonna fold them in half and cut them in half. These size pieces will cover up the whole musubi. I happen to really like nori. If you don't like it so much, cut them in thirds. Now there's two different sides of the nori. 
One is textured, one is smooth and shiny. You want the texture side up when you put your rice and your spam down. And then you simply wrap the nori around the rice and spam to where you can see the nice smooth shiny side. And then to seal the nori, you just rub a little bit of water and roll it all the way up. Mine weren't perfectly shaped on the ends, but that's nothing a sharp knife couldn't take care of. And there you have it, Hawaiian Spam Musubi. This was the first time I ever made or tried musubi, and it was absolutely delicious. If you've never tried it, you definitely have to give it a try, even if you're not a fan of Spam like me. So today, I'm trying teriyaki flavored Spam and making Spam Hawaiian Fried Rice. So let's cut the teriyaki spam up into small cubes, give it a taste, and then make some Hawaiian fried rice. You guys already know the deal with my hands, so please don't give me grief about tucking my fingers in. The only knife that is capable of cutting through my skin is the Plastisu. After all, I'm a trained professional. Well, at least I play one on YouTube, and I have Kevlar skin. Here's what it looks like up close. I gave it a try, and this spam is absolutely delicious. It has a great flavor, but it's more of a garlic flavor than teriyaki, which is fine with me. But I was expecting it to taste more like teriyaki. Either way, it's really good, but the texture is much softer than normal Spam. And I attribute that to the additional ingredients like mechanically separated chicken, which when you get into that phase, this is more like bologna or hot dog loaf. Hormel, if you're listening, please stop adding chicken to glorious Spam. I found myself continuously eating pieces of the teriyaki Spam. Honestly, I could have eaten it all straight out of the can. I'm asked a lot if you can make stir-fry foods in a skillet if you don't have a wok, and the answer is yes. So that's what I'm going to do today. In a large skillet over medium-high heat, add some oil, and it looks like a lot of oil, but this is all the oil that's going to be used in the whole dish. Once the oil is hot, pour in three scrambled eggs. After you pour the eggs in, let them sit for about 30 seconds. This will help keep them from sticking. After 30 seconds, start stir frying and chopping up the eggs. The total cook time for the eggs is about one minute, and that includes the first 30 seconds. Once the eggs are just cooked through, take them out of the skillet. Then add the cubed up teriyaki spam and stir fry for two to three minutes or until it begins to caramelize and get a nice crispy crust on the outside. Once it's browned up nicely, add fresh, homegrown, organic store-bought minced garlic straight out of the jar, even though it already had a great garlic flavor. You can never have enough garlic, can you? Then add chopped onion and bell pepper, which I normally don't put into fried rice, but this is Hawaiian fried rice. I have no idea why that means it needs bell pepper, but I thought it did to be different. Depending on how big your vegetables are when you cut them up and how tender you like them, the cooking time will vary. My wife cut these up for me using one of these vegetable choppers, which cut them into pretty small pieces, smaller than I would normally cut them. But hey, I can't be picky. I didn't have to cut them up. So I'm only stir frying for about 30 seconds because I like tender crisp vegetables. After 30 seconds, add frozen peas and carrots. If you wanna use fresh, go for it. Stir fry for another 30 seconds. Then add the bottom white part of some chopped green onion. And then stir fry for another 30 seconds. After stir frying for 30 seconds, add three cups of cooked day old rice and stir fry for two to three minutes. After two to three minutes, add oyster sauce and teriyaki sauce and give it a quick stir fry. Then add sesame oil and the eggs and stir fry for another 30 seconds. 
Now this next ingredient is optional, but to me, you gotta have it with Hawaiian food. Unfortunately, I found out about the hatred towards this ingredient in the Hawaiian pizza video, but I'm gonna add it anyway. Fresh, organic, homegrown pineapple right out of the can along with the tops of green onions. Give that a quick mix. Like I said, this is not your typical fried rice. And I know a lot of you say pineapple doesn't belong on a pizza, and I'm sure you're gonna say it doesn't belong in fried rice either. But I think it's good on pizza, and I think it's gonna be good in this fried rice. Once it's plated up, the only thing left to do is to give it a try. And it certainly looks good, but that doesn't matter. It's how it tastes that counts. So I tried a piece of the cooked teriyaki spam first. Although the flavor was really good and it got a nice crust on it, the inside texture was totally ruined when it cooked. It's pretty much mush inside. There's no texture to it. It reminds me a lot of treat, which I think is pretty gross. But like I said, flavor-wise, the teriyaki spam is good. So then I tried to bite with a little bit of everything and it was delicious. The teriyaki sauce is a nice change up to fried rice. I like the crunch of the bell peppers and the onions. And to be perfectly honest, I think the pineapple made this fried rice. The sweetness from the pineapple really balanced out the salt and the Spam, the teriyaki sauce, and the oyster sauce. Overall, flavor-wise, this was delicious. I absolutely loved the teriyaki Spam out of the can, even though the texture was still a little funky then. But once it was cooked, I did not care for the texture one bit. I would certainly make the Spam Hawaiian fried rice again, but I would use original Spam. Then I remembered back in the day when I was studying horticulture at the University of Colorado that I'd eat anything when I got the munchies. So I bought this can of Spam flavored macadamia nuts. I mean, what could be better than Spam nuts at 4.20 in the afternoon after a long day of studying at the University of Colorado? But after I tasted a couple of these, I got pissed off to the highest level of pissivity. I spent $11.28 on a can of Spam macadamia nuts that tastes absolutely nothing at all like Spam. Well, that's the what are we eating part of this video, and it's the quickest one ever. That sounds like something my wife would say. So now, let's get to the what are we cooking part of this video. I didn't want to totally waste the $11.28, so I pushed real hard and had a brain fart and came up with the idea of making Spam cookies. Yes, Spam cookies. Before you gag, stick with me here. Damn, I hadn't said that in a while. Obviously, you need Spam for the Spam cookies, but I didn't need the whole can, so I fried up a few pieces for breakfast later in the week. Then I cubed up four slices and threw them into a skillet over medium-high heat to fry and render until nice and crispy. The rendering process took a total of about 10 minutes. Once the fat had rendered, the Spam was to the perfect level of crispification. Then I added brown sugar to candy the Spam. Then I cooked the Spam and the brown sugar for about five minutes. You didn't think I was just gonna put plain Spam in the cookies, did you? After five minutes, the candied Spam is done. And when you remove it, place it on a plate, but make sure it's all separate because it's gonna harden and you don't want it all sticking together. It's kind of like Spam brittle. So far in this video, I've mentioned meth and wacky tobacco. Now I'm gonna mention crack. Candied Spam is crack because once you start, you can't stop. I should have just stopped right here and ate it all instead of doing this video. It's so good and I highly recommend you try some. Let's see if I can come up with a heroin analogy before the video's over. Now let's put everything together to make the Spam cookies. In a large bowl, add a bag of Betty Crocker sugar cookie mix. I'm sure you can use any brand you like or your homemade sugar cookie recipe. Then a whole stick of room temperature butter. A couple tablespoons of water. and white chocolate chips. And I used about a half a bag of chocolate chips. You might need to add more, depending on what grade stuff you're blazing, I mean studying. And I don't know why, but I gave it a mix at this point. Now I chopped up the macadamia nuts, so now I'm gonna add them. along with the crack. And I almost forgot the egg.
Then give it all a good mix until it's well blended. And I did have to add just a little bit more water. Now place spoonfuls of the Spam dough on a baking sheet. I'm using a silicone mat. You don't have to, but that's what I'm doing because it's easy to clean up and I'm lazy. Then bake these according to the directions on the package. And then when they're done, they look like chocolate chip cookies. Go figure. But don't let that fool you. Hash brownies look like regular brownies too. I couldn't think of a heroin analogy, so I used hash instead. I better shut up. DEA is going to be at my door soon. Once they cooled sufficiently, it was time to try one. And I didn't feel it was appropriate to have spam cookies with a glass of milk. So I had a glass of Crown Royal instead. I did one thing very, 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 very wrong. I didn't add enough Spam. For that size bag and mix, I should have added the whole can. But there was still enough Spam in the cookies to give you the taste and the texture. And the cookies, believe it or not, were delicious. They were obviously nice and moist, as you could see. And the chocolate and the Spam, everything went well together. It sounds like a really funky cookie, but it's a really delicious cookie. Today, I'm turning America's favorite processed meat, Spam, into a meat lover style blooming onion. I guess we could call it a bloomin' spamion. This version is not low carb, but with a couple tweaks can be. So let's get started. You're obviously gonna need a can of spam, and any flavor spam will work. I'm using a low sodium spam. Now take a knife and slice down the center of the length of the Spam three quarters of the way down. You obviously just want to make sure you don't cut all the way through. Now you have two pieces on each side. Find the center piece of those and do the same thing. If you'd like a printable copy of this recipe with a full list of ingredients and easy to follow instructions, visit thewolfpit.com. Now find the center of the Spam widthwise and do the same thing. Now find the center of those two pieces and slice down three quarters of the way. Now you'll have four pieces widthwise and you want to repeat the process between each piece for a total of seven cuts widthwise and three cuts lengthwise. I'm really sorry if I'm making this more complicated than the instructions that come with a piece of IKEA furniture. It's really just a matter of common sense once you start slicing. You just want to end up with nice uniform pieces all the way around. Now you want to very generously season the Spam and make sure you get down in all the cuts with your favorite rub. I'm using Wolf Rub Original Barbecue Seasoning because it's a sweet rub and it has cinnamon in it. And cinnamon goes great with pork and ham, which is what Spam is made of. And yes, I know before you say it, I know that ham is pork. Now flip the Spam over and make sure you shake out any excess rub that's down in the cracks because you don't want big clumps of rub. Now roll the Spam in the rub and ensure the whole loaf of Spam is seasoned. Now repeat that same process with cornstarch. Bloomin' onions are crunchy on the outside with sweet tender onions on the inside. The cornstarch will actually fry as the Spam begins to render its fat, which will give us a nice crispy texture on the outside. Now I'm going to put this into the refrigerator for about an hour and that will help everything bond to the Spam. You can skip this step if you want to, but it will help you have a better finished product. Now place the Spam in a preheated 250 degree smoker, and today I'm using my Rectec RT300 pellet grill, along with Rectec's Perfect Mix pellets, which is a combination of hickory, cherry, maple, and apple. Now close the lid and let it smoke at 250 degrees for 45 minutes, then increase the temperature to 325 degrees for another 45 minutes, or until nice and golden brown and crispy. And there you have it, a nice smoky and crispy Bloomin' Spam In. Now serve it with some Sriracha mayonnaise, which is nothing more than equal parts Sriracha and mayonnaise, or use less Sriracha if you don't like it as spicy. Then you simply pull it apart and eat it just like you would a Bloomin' Onion. This really did look and turn out a whole lot better than I thought it would. Each Spam finger was crispy and crunchy on the outside, and nice and moist and tender on the inside. 
And when you make these, you might as well go ahead and make two or three, because as you can see, I can't stop eating it. It's addictive. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Wolf Pit. Hawaiian pizza. I'm sure at some point in most of our lives, this commercialized atrocity has been forced down our gullets at a work function, family get together, or party. When you have that one individual that has to order a Hawaiian pizza from the local pizza chain and you feel obligated to eat a slice. I know I have, and personally, I'm not a fan of the Hawaiian pizza. I think these chains are doing it all wrong with ham or chicken and pineapple. I've never been to Hawaii, but I feel if you're gonna call a pizza a Hawaiian pizza, it should at least have the Hawaiian's beloved Spam on it. No other meat besides Kahlua pork makes sense to put on a Hawaiian pizza besides Spam. So that's what I'm gonna do today and make a Spam Hawaiian pizza. But I'm gonna kick it up a couple extra notches. So let's get started. Let's start with the obvious. For a Spam pizza, you need a can of Spam. I'm just using a can of original Spam, full fat, full sodium. I've cut it into five fairly thick slices. And then I season them with GQ Barbecue's The Rub Barbecue Seasoning. This is good stuff. You can use this or your favorite barbecue rub. I grilled the Spam over moderate heat. I wasn't really sure how well it would hold up to really high heat. So I kept the grill temperature right around 350 degrees, which is pretty low for grilling. I put the Spam on the grill at an angle to get some nice grill marks for absolutely no reason because I was planning on cutting it up anyway. But I wanted to at least make it look nice while it was on the grill for you, the people. After about three minutes, give the Spam slices a quarter turn. And again, this is totally optional. Unless you too are doing it for you, the people. And then let them go for another three minutes. After a total of six minutes, or until your desired crispification on that side, give them a flip. Then let them grill for another five to six minutes. Once the Spam is grilled for about 12 minutes total, I'm gonna to baste it with the most appropriate sauce I could find, King's Hawaiian barbecue sauce. This is the same people that make crack. I mean those Hawaiian rolls, which are technically crack. Now if they only made a pizza crust out of the Hawaiian rolls, yum. I'm only going to baste one side of the Spam as I don't want it to be too sweet with the pineapple. Once all the Spam is coated, close the lid and let it caramelize for about three to four minutes. Then remove the Spam and cut it into medium sized chunks. Then to add even more flavor, throw your pineapple rings onto the grill. And I only want a slight char for a little extra flavor. So after about 45 seconds, give them a turn again for no other reason than to look nice while they're on the grill for you, the people, because they're gonna get cut up soon. Then after another 45 seconds, give them a flip and let them go for another minute and a half. Now I apologize, I forgot to hit the record button. As most of you already know, I'm not much of a mixer, dough roller, dough tosser, baker, etc. So you're not gonna see me making pizza dough anytime soon. So I'm using a baba buoy. I mean a baboli pizza crust. And I debated for quite a while on using the King's Hawaiian barbecue sauce instead of the pizza sauce. But I ended up thinking it would be too sweet. 
So I ended up using Cento's pizza sauce. And you can use as much or as little as you like. Or if you're really desperate and you've totally given up on life, you can use the pizza toast spread. Next I added a generous amount of freshly shredded mozzarella cheese. Followed by a generous amount of freshly shredded smoked Gouda. Which will add a really nice layer of flavor. Then the cubed up barbecue spam. And this almost didn't make it on the pizza. We started tasting it and couldn't stop. Sweet and salty fatty spam is addictive with cold beer. Then a layer of thin sliced bell pepper. I'm using green bell pepper, red, yellow, orange would be fine too. Then some thinly sliced red onion. And of course you can cut all of these as thick or as thin as you like and as much or as little as you like. And last but not least, and probably the most disliked ingredient on Hawaiian pizza, the pineapple. But maybe the grilled pineapple will change that. Now I've got my grill up to 600 degrees and I added the pizza on top of the grill grate only because it was already there, not for any other reason. If it wasn't on the grill for the Spam and Pineapple, I would have just put it on the main grate. And by the way, the pizza was on the indirect side of the grill. You want your fire to stay screaming hot, so keep your top and bottom vents 100% open, and leave the lid cracked open to give it a good constant flow of oxygen. Four minutes later, and our pizza is done and it was smelling good in the neighborhood. After letting it rest for about five minutes, we cut it up. And I wasn't sure why I felt the need to almost feed the pizza to the camera, but that was a pretty close close-up, wasn't it? but I have to blame that on the cold beer. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Like I said in the beginning of this video, I wasn't a fan of Hawaiian pizza and I'm still not from the chain places. But with the combination of the grilled Spam, the barbecue sauce, the Gouda cheese, and the Baba Booey crust, this was amazing and changed my attitude about Hawaiian pizza. Thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you soon.